From there, I'd like to turn to uh, Chris Smith, who is going to talk to us about why LLC, the LLC, LCC program, was started by the uh, NMRA, and there was a lot of discussion about it early on. Uh, I don't hear that much discussion about it right now. And I don't think a lot of modelers, myself included, really know if, if LCC is something that we should be paying a lot of attention to. And that's why I was uh, really pleased when Chris Smith came along and said, well, I'd like to, uh, to try to put some uh, information out about it. And so, Chris, thank you so much for doing this. You betcha. Hello, everybody. So, so this segment... What we're going to do is try to discuss a fairly technical subject a little differently. And what we want to do in doing this is consider, rather than how to implement a layout control network, let's talk about why layout control using a communication butt network bus network in the first place. As a matter of fact, now I want to make it clear what, what I don't want to give the impression is this is about why should you have a layout control bus or network. As a matter of fact, I could have named this segment why we might not need layout control in our model railroading. So if that's your takeaway from this segment, then that's just as appropriate as to if you might learn why you might need it. So we're not going to talk about how, how to install, how to wire, how to buy, what components per se. We're going to concentrate on why we might need it. So let's assume for this segment that we're a model railroader, individual or group planning, building or modifying a layout or that we're on a planning team or club committee and talk about planning considerations that may be appropriate for your particular situation. So the agenda, what we'll do is we'll try to define layout control network or bus, talk briefly about general bus configurations why we might use it, which will be the line share of what we'll talk about. And then in a future segment, when we get time to do it, we'll do how I particularly use layout control, and then we'll summarize and perhaps discussion. Little bit about me, I've been model railroading in N-Scale since 69. I built my DCC system from a kit in 1997, it is still running the layout. I also built and programmed a nine node CMRI system that is up and operating, all for a 600 square foot layout for operating. I'm also a crossover hobbyist. I'm an avid turbine jet modeler and flyer. And I spent 28 years on active duty as a gunship pilot for Army Special Ops. And currently I'm a contract maintenance and development test pilot for Army Special Ops. So that's just a little bit about me. Now, my perspective, when talking about layout control networking or layout command control LCC, here's how I approach it. Number one, I'm not a computer hobbyist. I'm not an electronics hobbyist. I'm not a professional computer programmer. I'm a model railroader who identified a need or functions that I wanted for my own layout and learn what I needed to learn. And as you all know, layout control tends to be a, a relatively complex subject. So there's some application the model railroader might want to look into but it is a difficult subject. And the reason I feel it's a difficult subject is because it's a niche subject. So let's look at, let's think for a minute. Let's take the population of model railroaders out there. Let's say out of 100% model railroaders, 
how many of that population even has a layout, is planning to build a layout, or is considering a layout sometime in his future? And I've heard estimates as high as 80% of model railroaders have a layout or are working on a layout. I think that's way overly optimistic. That might be a good discussion for the after show with Clark, what everybody thinks. But in my impression from decades of reading, I'm going to say I'm still going to remain optimistic, but I'm going to say we're more like 50% at best, have or are building a model railroad layout. So as you see in this subject, the population starts to dwindle. So how many of that population of layout owners is considering operating with a group of friends and a couple of enemies in the basement? You can see the numbers start to dwindle even more now, this could be small layout. This could be large basement size layout. Part of the problem is what defines a layout. But let's continue. So now we have a small population of model railroads with layouts that need or are planning a layout control net. In fact, I'm going to say we're looking at, say, 10% of model railroaders have a need or an interest in layout control networking or a layout control bus. So it makes this subject relatively difficult to talk about. It's very in-depth type of subject for a general model railroading audience. And to go with that, how long has NMRA's LCC been a thing? It's been a thing for at least a decade. Layout control networking has been a thing well, for example, CMRI was available in 1985 to, to model railroaders. So as you can see, and this is simply my theory, my opinion, it's a very small population of model railroaders that might need layout control networking. So it's a hard subject to discuss. It's important to note what layout control is not. Here again, my opinion. Number one, for most of us, at least in North America, it's not about automated train running. I call that rule 98. If you were to ask me out of the top priorities for implementing a layout control network, automated train running would be about number 98 out of 100. It's that low on the totem pole. And that's true for most model railroad layout owners because we are model railroaders. We want to run our trains. It isn't that much fun to have a computer running trains for us. The other thing is it's not just about signals. That's a big reason to go for a, a layout control bus, but not the only reason. It's also not about code writing. There are plenty of solutions in model railroad layout control that don't involve the model railroad or doing a lot or any code writing. And it's likely, as we stated, not something that's needed for most model railroaders. The other thing that's important to note is it is not to replace DCC. It wasn't intended, even the NMRA's layout Command control is not intended to replace DCC. It predates DCC by decades, layout control network. Now, does your layout, let's say we have a big layout. Let's say we have people that come over to, to run trains. Does our layout have to be network? Well, fundamental layout control, if you have hand operated like a Pico, point operated turnout or hand throws like on some locations on my model railroad in the picture there's a ground throw a caboose ground throw that's layout control it just isn't for the purpose of this discussion layout control networking 
because they're they're not this this throw isn't communicating with any other device on the layout per se. In addition, Fast Tracks Bullfrog, for example, a kit you can buy to operate your turnouts remotely by cable. Machine operated tortoise switch machines. And in my case, I still have a few DCC accessory bus DCC machines that operate some crossovers. Those are all layout control items, but they're not networked per se. Now in considering turnout control, when we talk about remote, just to clarify a little bit, remote control kind of has a new definition nowadays, wherein you're controlling a device outside of the layout room, for example. But in reality, remote control also means that the operator, the crewman, is not next to the turnout and throwing it by hand. So a cable or a switch machine with a toggle in the fascia is remote control, but it's evolving to include now networking outside of the layout room through internet, not to be confused. Now where we might start needing to talk about a layout control network, a bus communication system in the layout is when we want to talk about prototype turnout control. Prototype turnout control is more than some are motorized and some are hand throw levers and padlocks. There are also rules and protocols and features in some prototype turnouts that can be emulated realistically using a layout control bus that includes some logic. Now power only, and these are prototype terms, power only type switches as a railroader would call it, is one that generally only a remote towerman or dispatcher operates. They really don't have track side provisions for the crew. Dual control, typically associated with a control point in a CTC environment, for example, would have both localized crew ability track side, as well as typically they're run remotely by a dispatcher. Electric controlled type turnouts involve logic that says, hey, crewman, I'm not gonna let you open this switch until I do some safety checks. And then of course there's padlock type. This is where we now consider potential for a layout control bus. So what is layout control? For the purpose of this discussion, it's a system for controlling the functions on the layout separate from whatever controls the locomotives on the layout. These functions then are connected to a communication bus network. Now it's not necessarily defined as LCC. And the reason we say that is because LCC is now a very specific communication standard adopted, that it's not a total description. As a matter of fact, layout control networks, there are a number of solutions. LCC of course, being one of those solutions. But each of these are different in some ways, similar, similar in other ways with different particular communication standards. Now I'm gonna keep rolling fairly quickly through here. There's a, there's a fair amount of things to look at in roughly 30 minutes. But just a refresher for those that may not know, LCC is the NMRA's trademark term for layout control network. It used to be called NMRA net. It was based on choosing from a number of proposals sent in by different organizations and individuals, and they adopted the open LCB group standards. And that standard, what's the backbone of that standard is CAN, CAN bus, C-A-N, CAN bus communication. 
it utilizes ideally in its base form, it uses what's called producer consumer type network concept, wherein something, some device produces an event, then that event is consumed by one or more devices on the communication network. So you push a button and the, it produces an event, a consumer device that has a turnout motor swaps the points on a switch. CAN bus, it's simply a vehicle bus standard that falls within the OBD2 troubleshooting and diagnostics form. The CAN bus is one of those Basically, there are five general automotive type bus systems. If you have a modern car, it may likely have CAN bus in it. It was developed by Bosch. And so the point of this is that the LCC choice for going with CAN bus communication is a pretty good choice. It's so well documented. Industry understands it. And it has features being a producer consumer type system where devices communicate each other between applications, but without a host computer, that was a pretty high priority item for the NMRA. If you look at some of, I extracted some of the NMRA's goals for layout command control, interoperability, but one of the big things is because there is admittedly a little bit of computer phobia in the model railroading community. And for good reason, a lot of model railroaders don't have computers. So you don't wanna have a system that demands a computer, but there has to be an understanding that in some applications of a computer bus network or a layout control network, you may just well need a PC, depending on what sophistication or functionality you're looking for, like CTC. Other standards, CMRI has probably been the longest running layout control bus system used for model railroading. Uh, Dr. Chubb estimates somewhere around 3,000 layouts have CMRI. They are everywhere pretty much. It uses not CAN bus, but it uses RS-232 converted either to 422 or 485 serial. And its primary characteristic is it's one of the master slave polled configurations, wherein there's a master computer that polls slave nodes for information and then calculates based on that information. Now, I call them dumb nodes. And the benefit of a dumb node is that this circuit card, if I show you this circuit card right here, I can pull that card and replace it with a spare simply by unhooking the Molex connectors. But there's absolutely no logic or software changes required. It falls into place. The computer doesn't even care. All it needs to know is the dip switch is set to the correct node address and you're off and running. So that's a dumb node. It reacts to, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Digitrax Loconet, some of you are familiar with that. Digitrax calls that proprietary ethernet. I'm not sure what they mean by that, but it is also a plug-in type, but it's very proprietary. It is designed not to need additional bus wiring. So what that tells me, and I haven't done a lot of study on it, but I do know fellows that are using it and using it with success. Um, supposedly, it doesn't need a lot of additional bus wiring. Now, where does Arduino fit into this? Think of Arduino. We're all familiar with standalone closed loop Arduino, where you set it up for animation, like you've got a town with lights you want lights blinking on and off and other, you might have noises or the proverbial tornado display. Arduino is simply a hardware solution. It could be used with almost any net standard. There are shields you can get for Arduino for Wi-Fi, for Ethernet, for CAN bus. So it could be used in an LCC application. 
And it can also, Seth has them as CP nodes that can be integrated into a CMRI bus network. So don't think of Arduino as a net standard in and of itself. It's just a piece of hardware that a manufacturer could use for a layout control network. So let's look at a generic layout. Now this happens to be my layout in general form. You've got a West staging over here. So we got West staging over here. Essentially, it's 120 some feet of shelf layout, really. And then you've got E staging over here. Nothing special. And we're not going to focus on track plan or any of that. We'll just demonstrate, OK, here's a generic layout. And we're considering a layout control network. Now, could be that we're going to consider a layout control network for a generic shelf or smaller layout. This could be just as applicable. So the pro there is a specific process. Most of you all have thought of this when you approach pretty much any project in model railroading or any project in any other endeavor. What are we trying to achieve? What we don't want to do is get the cart before the horse. And you can get down a rabbit hole in layout control bus type things um, at your peril. So what we want to do is we want to think about what are we trying to achieve? What functionally do we want? What did the real railroad do? What hardware is appropriate and what communication standard suits the goals? It could very well be when we talk about communication standard, if you're a modular club or setting up a layout in an environment that doesn't support, for example, Wi-Fi, that would probably not be a standard you would adopt. In the general producer consumer configuration, you have a series of nodes that are interconnected by a small wire communication bus. The nodes are distributed. And like we said, and this is pretty much what CAN bus LCC will do, devices produce events, other devices then consume those events. Ideally, the setup for a lot of folks would be that notice we don't need a computer to run all of this. It's just the nodes, they're set up, and then they're running. It's not quite that simple. It's quite often that you're going to end up needing some form of human interface, an iPad or computer, in order to set up the nodes so that they can run autonomously. And in some cases, with more complicated functionality, perhaps even a permanent host controller on the network. In contrast, the master-slave type of bus standard uses a master computer. Here we have our master computer. And then it's also connected much the same. Now, these nodes are shown pretty much how they are on my layout. You gang the nodes where they need to be for hot areas that have a lot more um, functionality for instance, around four, five, and six, and others can be more spread out. Now, there's a temptation. Well, first of all, with the master-slave, again, the master computer pulls for inputs, takes those inputs from the slave nodes, calculates what to do with those inputs, like push buttons, detectors, um, and other types of input devices, calculates what to do, and then it sends the nodes messages on what to do as a result. Turn on LEDs, operate signals, turn switch motors. That's a master slave. So all of the processing is done here at the master computer. The dumb nodes simply react, send messages when polled, and react. Again, with any control network, distribution of the nodes is pretty key. Let's say we want to try to cheat the system and go with a super node, or we want to gang a bunch of nodes centrally because it might look easier to hook up and wire. But notice if I've got to cross these layout benches with wiring to a device in the West staging, those are long, enormous wire runs. In contrast, if we distribute our nodes, 
the devices can be managed easier, shorter wire runs. And then with this kind of system, you can isolate node eight and run troubleshooting diagnostics if you need to, or chase wires that are a lot shorter. So there's a benefit to this distribution plan for nodes on a layout. Now, a small layout might only need one node or say a couple of nodes. Now we add the signal. So you can see the nodes. There are a number of devices. Now this is not representative of my layout. Node eight has actually in their neighborhood of 16 track detectors, 20 turnout motors and a lot more signals. Speaking of the signals, the hardware choices we make in planning are very critical. In my case, a searchlight signal, I use a single LED with a dual element. So you have a green element and a red element, but you're talking about two outputs from that node in order to operate that searchlight signal. And as most of you know, when you combine green and red, you get yellow. That's why these particular LEDs work very well but it minimizes the amount of outputs. So it minimizes the size and number of total nodes. In contrast to that, had I gone with, in my case, three element color light type signals, I would need another output line. And I calculated in my case that I would have needed another 120 some output lines, which is about three more CMRI nodes. So that choice is something that we want to get ahead of in the planning process to determine how much output are you going to need. If you look at, say, you're a Penzi fan and you look at a Penzi uh, signal head, we could pair some of these and get the same thing and get three outputs. Now, if you need approach lighting where they're dark until a train approaches a circuit, you might need four in order to light up this uh, center. So signal hardware is a very important planning consideration. Now, obviously you don't need to talk about signals if you don't need to adapt signals. But if we're gonna think about that in planning our layout or modifying our layout, these are the kind of things that we wanna dig into. In my case, if you look at these signals, my signals are scratch built, this is N scale. So this, there's a signal bridge here with two signal masks that are double headed. So each of the LEDs has three wires. So that's six wires running down a 1 16th outer diameter tube. So the inner diameter is much less. You can see with six wires and then they all come together and there are 12 wires running down this 332nd tube into the ground. So planning wire sizes, planning how many wires need to move through your signals is a consideration to make not just the size of your nodes. Node distribution, very important, break the layout up. In matter of fact, I did it kind of like I broke up the layout for the DCC booster zones. And we then can easy troubleshoot, document, and maintain with say eight separate layouts rather than one big layout. So it's eight separate layouts working together. So the process again, what were we trying to achieve and what are the goals? Then we can talk about what hardware to drag in. Now, if you're adopting, say, what about established layouts that might want to adopt a layout control network? I stole these out of a operations primer. We're all pretty familiar with what control elements are needed to have, say, a prototype operating layout. You need locomotive control, some kind of car forwarding or car control. You need traffic or movement on main tracks type. For layout control, I modified the slide to show where I think that we need to emphasize the potential need for layout control. 
In this case, we know about DC, DCC, we've got battery control, rubber band, or hands. DC, one of the primary reasons Dr. Bruce Chubb developed CMRI was to provide DC automation of the power districts. As a train moved, it would automatically assign the next power district to that particular throttle. So this predates even DCC, and it wasn't all about signals. When you talk about car control and switchless, there's perhaps a case could be made for a switchless on a layout control network if you're using something like RFID. In my case, I use NFC, which is near field communication. There's a tag on every piece of rolling stock. And as the train ro rolls over that reader, it can then send a message as to what that car is, what switch list it needs to go into, and where that car is to the dispatcher. So that's a case. But generally, car control, freight forwarding, you don't need um, a layout control network unless you really want one. Traffic control is a little different. Now, these are all how railroads maintain authority to occupy or move on main tracks. It, you track warrant control, direct traffic control, yard limits, timetable train order, and CTC. Layouts can use mother may I. Even clubs will use mother may I. We've highlighted TTTO and CTC. CTC, pretty much, if you want to adopt true CTC, you're talking about needing layout control network. While we're talking about signals, I took this out of a signals clinic very briefly. There is a difference between ABS, automatic block signal, and APB. They both do not have authority to convey movement over main tracks. They're both uncontrolled, but the difference is a matter of logic. With ABS, they're designed for double track primarily, but they are designed by the real railroads to maintain brake distance between trains moving in the same direction. So they're fairly nearsighted. You could conceivably employ ABS signaling on your layout without a layout control network. Absolute permissive block, on the other hand, is designed to protect trains on opposing movements, primarily in single track territory. So there's logic involved in that. There's head block triggering and the need to tumble down signals in the opposing move direction to red so that two trains can't occupy single track at the same time if a dispatcher isn't paying attention. So there's logic involved. Now we're talking about a potential need for a network. Um, train order, timetable train order. If you're modeling more recent errors, eras where train order signals were, were integrated in block signaling in order to give the crew warning that a stop was up ahead. They could give you an approach signal in the ABS signaling, for example. That was more of a modern feature. But the other thing is that if, you know, when the railroad started to lay off towermen and station operators, they had to adopt a way to OS automatically before radio days so you would get an OS bell or some kind of horn, perhaps in the dispatcher office. That would probably require some kind of layout control network to emulate that. Yard limits, I left that in here. What yard limits can do for you if we operate it properly, and that's a whole clinic in and of itself. We generally don't get this right, but you can really mess up your control points on a layout control bus network by planting your yard limit signs in the wrong place. That's another discussion. So what about speed versus route signaling? There is a difference. The aspects are different. 
Um, they convey different rules. There are similarities, but generally, if you're a Western half of the continent modeler, you're probably looking at root signaling. If you're an Eastern half of the continent modeler, your prototype might be using speed signals. A layout control bus can handle that without changing hardware. That's a very important thing to note. So there's a case for layout control busing your signal system. What is CTC? Here's where we really need to be talking about a layout control bus. It's how you handle heavy traffic. They're dispatcher controlled. That means they're controlled type signals. Um, incidentally, in the, in the fabrication or the layout building and the track laying, if you're using CTC, the gapping of the control points are extremely important. A single track turnout is in fact an interlocking in the CTC world. And the gapping and the position of the signal mass are critical. They indicate the gap boundaries. So we said dispatchers control, track warrant control, DTC, yard limits, timetable train order. It, it is how they manage the movement on main tracks. They're all dispatcher managed. So with CTC, since CTC is the only kind of signaling that can grant authorities and they are controlled, then you need a layout control bus because you need a real time while operating human interface and a dispatcher sitting there integrated with the layout. Um, we don't need to go into much detail other than it's hard to cheat with true CTC. CTC is very tailored to the specific track arrangement. So each layout has to consider how those control points are going to interact and interact with trains and how the dispatcher is going to manage the traffic flow. And of course, they're very logic dependent. Centralized traffic control uses locking protocols. And so for every locking protocol, you have to have an, inner, an unlocking protocol, meaning as the system locks, then it has to have a way to unlock. That's very logic intense. It's hard to cheat to actually emulate what the real railroads are doing. And again, the point is that a human can't manage that, even on a model railroad that has dense traffic, as well as a computer can do it. So there's a big case for a layout control network. With CTC, it's important to note dispatchers don't decide if a signal is cleared or a route can be changed. He can only request it. We can show examples of that, but we don't have time tonight for this particular segment. But again, how that works, the model railroader has to understand what he might do in the case where we have an encroachment on a circuit. David Barrow sitting here at his machine, there's nothing he can do about clearing that signal. So this train moving eastbound, this A train can get through. So there, it builds confusion if the logic isn't there to help the crews. All right. J let's look for briefly and then we'll finish for tonight, look briefly about what's involved in the input outputs of a generic. This is, a, this is not my track plan per se, but let's look at a single track with two controlled sidings. You've got to have de detection for the control points, which is the turnouts themselves with clearance space, and then turnout motors. Now, what about turnout feedback? Most will advise that that is totally unnecessary in a model railroad. You don't need point position feedback to have it work very reliably, especially with reliable motor systems like some of the better servo and controllers and tortoise switch machines. 
So we recommend you don't, plus it adds a ton of input demands on the nodes. So you've got head block detection, and I'm rolling fast, and I apologize for moving so fast. Then you've got your other single track detection. So at the end, your detection input devices were at 13 for two passing sidings and the intermediate single track. In the case of signaling, we got 20 searchlight devices for 40 output lines plus four additional for the motors. So you can see how the planning is going to help you determine the distribution. Now let's take the modular layout real briefly. This is where our thinking caps really need to be turned on. If you're on a group talking about a modular club looking into a layout control network, now we really need to start thinking about how we might do this. And I'm not going to offer solutions. I'm just going to offer some considerations. Let's take the single track siding here, single track in between, maybe a junction or a yard, followed by another section of single track. You've got your control point that have to be segregated and detected, and they're far-sighted, meaning this control point might have an impact on another control point down the line eastbound. So here's a prime case for a layout control network so that these control points and a dispatcher can interact with them. Perhaps you could gang these modules permanently where they're always together, then the nodes are near them. And then these intermediate sections are what you might change for every show or for every setup with a, a, another group or another layout club. And then figure out, well, do we use producer consumer type architecture or do we use master slave type architecture? How do we tell each node what the new events that are going to react to. All of these are questions that we want to dig into. And again, since there's so many variables, it's hard to offer that solution. The group has to sit down and think that through. But in my opinion, especially for a modular group that goes to shows, do whatever it takes to put a layout control network on that layout. Young people, the public, like the idea of interaction. Animation is one thing, like, say, the proverbial tornado. But where you have a dispatcher running trains, you could have an animation director sitting at a computer that can react to the crowd. A child comes, points out something. You could have something on the bus that reacts to that child controlled either by a human or by some other kind of sensor. So what I'm recommending is do whatever it takes. Here we are, interactive animation, inhibit control. For example, your layout control bus with one flick of a switch could inhibit the the public aisle side controls. And then when it's just the group operating, you could uninhibit and have aisle side controls, turnouts and other devices. So in summary, we, we, we defy, define briefly a layout control network bus. We talked about two basic bus configurations some have advantages over others. And then we spent some time talking about why we might use layout control. Obviously, signaling is a big deal, but not necessarily the only reason. It could be you want remote access to all of the turnouts or some of the turnouts, or you may on a small layout just want one interlocking plant that's communicating all of the devices together. There's a lot of variables. Uh, the next segment, it, sometime in the future, we'll talk about how I applied. Um, this is a CMRI node here. This is one of the staging yard control areas that has relay control. The computer does automatically for when a stage train is 
allowed to leave, it powers up that track so that the decoders aren't sitting there sounding off the whole time. And it also aligns the ladder, for example. We have some of my turnout control panels uh, and the dispatcher panel. We'll go through how I did that, but it's not gonna be a class on wiring for sure. Some thoughts to leave you with why or why we don't need LC. If you figured out based on what I've talked about with signaling and various types of traffic control, if, you're, if that's not what your layout needs, then great. You don't need a layout control system. And there's been some hype lately in LCC in the last say 10 years. Um, but again, it's a niche subject. If you don't need it, you don't need it. And just because your buddy might have it doesn't mean you need it. Complex, complex is okay for the builder and layout owner, but in the end, when you're finished, it's not okay if your operators are confused or it's complicated for them to use. That's a design failure, if you will. It doesn't take that much extra effort to get to the 90%. If you're planting signals, wiring them up, lighting them up, and you have turnout toggles and you have track detection, you're 80% towards, say, a CTC signaling system. Don't be put off by the software requirements because it's just not that much more effort with help to make it truly functional. Identify the requirements, then assess the solutions. In my opinion, it's better to want layout control network but not really need it than to need it and just be afraid to implement or not want it because it might take some effort. So with that, um, I went a little long, Jim, so we'll press on. Chris, I can't thank you enough for doing it. It's the first time I think I understand the thought process that, that I would have to go through to decide whether I even want to have LCC or not. 